If you're wondering why Panther's having a snooze while I'm sitting on the floor, he's a bit tired from making sure the garlic was near the doors. He's also tired because yesterday he was picking his favorite vampire book for an upcoming video, and he does a lot of other work as well. So he's earned his rest, and in my house we accommodate the fur children. So back to Idiot's Guide. I enjoy the Idiot's Guides and for Dummies series. One, because I'm not easily offended, and two, I have a sarcastic sense of humor, which my coffee cup points out, fluent in sarcasm. Throughout the book, the author does use some sarcasm, so I'm mentioning it early, because for some people that may be a bit of a turnoff. I also suggest to people that before going out and purchasing a book, Check your public library and see if they have a copy that you can give a try and find out if it's something of interest to you. I also recommend checking out Goodreads as there are reviews on a wide range of books there. On page XVI, for those who know Roman numerals, that stands for page 16, they go through and tell you what's in each of the four boxes. So the additional information that you'll find throughout each of the chapters. The book is broken down into four parts. In number one, he covers what he calls point of entry, and he looks at the history, the literature, movies, and pop culture. In part two, gory lore, he looks at the legends and history of vampires a little bit more in depth. Part three, out of the coffin, humans who identify with vampires, vampire culture, and clinical cases of vampirism. Part four, classic vampires we love to hate. He goes on to take a closer look at Dracula and Bram Stoker, and he finishes that section with Anne Rice and the Vampire Chronicles. What I found a bit odd, considering this book was published in 2009, is there is no mention of Stephen King. Salem's Lot was published in 1975. Ironically, the year before Anne Rice began the interview with the Vampire series. So I'm not sure why this author didn't mention Salem's Lot throughout any of the book. What you'll notice as you read through this particular book is that he talks quite a bit about Vlad Tepes, about Elizabeth Bathory. So there is some repetition on page 13, he talks about Elizabeth Bathory, who inspired Le Fano's story, Carmilla. Vlad Tepes, for those who may not know, is the real-life character that Dracula is based on. On page 7, he talks about the vampire scares in real life. Now today, that may seem silly to some people, but you have to consider the time period when this happened. It's also why I mention publication dates when I'm talking about the different books. Because again, the information is relevant to the time period when that particular work was published. I believe it's important to know so that when you're reading something, particularly something of nonfiction, you're focusing on what other events were happening at that time? And why would an author have that opinion? Now, for something like this, which is based on going back through history, again, it gives you an idea of what was going on at the time and how could there possibly be a vampire scare. In the periods when there were vampire scares, there was no embalming. There were no funeral homes. Typically, when someone died, they were kept in the home, usually in the living room, and friends and family would come visit at the home. 
there were times, unfortunately, when people were accidentally buried alive. My father was born in a small village in Hungary, and when he was 12, he and his mother and two sisters came to join my grandfather in Canada, who had been here for 12 years saving money so that he could bring the family over. He used to tell me stories about what it was like growing up in a small village. And I remember one particular story that he shared with me because he knew that I enjoyed reading horror books. And he had told me about a time when someone in the village had passed. And as I mentioned earlier, when people died, they were left in the homes and friends and family came to the homes to pay their respect. The individual, there was some obvious medical condition, but they weren't dead. And they sat up in the living room wondering why all these people were around them. So you can imagine the kind of impact that had on the people who were visiting. On page eight, he talks about the history of Gothic fiction, that it emerged in England during the 18th century, so the 1700s, and that it centered on bizarre and supernatural occurrences involving things like and if you've read some of the Gothic novels, you'll recognize these. Haunted castles, crazy family members stowed away in the attic, depraved clergymen, and decayed aristocracy. On page 10, he talks about some of the different vampire movies and their beginnings. So, of course, he mentions Bella Lugosi, who was a Hungarian-American actor and best known for his portrayal of Dracula. Hey you, you gonna let me have the chair? Okay, since Panther has decided I can use the chair for filming, I decided to take advantage of that. He's off having a snack. On page 23, he talks about demons that are diabolical and traditionally their evil characteristics are in opposition to God. Monsters, on the other hand, are considered supernatural. Their evil characteristics are in opposition to nature. So he makes that distinction as in demons are against God, monsters are against nature. So that's where things like zombies would come up. On page 29, he talks about the vampire rules. And he says, not only do different authorities say different things about these matters, but different vampires within a story or virtual world may obey different rules. Keeping up with all of them can be a bewildering task. And I definitely agree. If you have seen my video, Voices from the Vault, then you'll remember that I mentioned as I was reading those short stories, I was making notes on the table of contents because there were different things that influenced and impacted vampires in those stories. If you're someone who's interested in the different rules of vampires, or maybe you're an aspiring author, or like me, you just enjoy writing for yourself, a great reference source is Writing the Paranormal Novel. And I'll be doing a review on this probably at some point in 2023. The author talks about how vampires become vampires, and there are a lot of different ways that can happen. So he mentions Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, and in that case, the vampire species began with the demon named Amel. He talks about the movie I Am Legend, and that involved the bacteria that turned people into vampires. We also have Dracula and many of the TV shows where it involves a bite in order to become a vampire. 
and a series that he didn't mention, which I'll be talking about in a few in my next video, is marked where it's genetic and at the age of 16 something kicks in and that process begins. On page 84 he makes an interesting point about why crosses don't work on all vampires. And again this is where knowing the dates and putting things in chronological order helps make sense of things. The explanation that he gives, and he mentions Lilith in particular, is that the ancient vampires predate Christianity. On page 108 and 109, the author does a comparison of vampires and witches. Personally, although I'm not a witch or a Wiccan, for those who are witches or Wiccans, it is a spiritual path. So I'm not sure why it keeps coming up in paranormal videos and topics. Part of it could be his comment on page 109. Vampires seem to act on instinct while witches practice the black arts. Sorry, for those who have actually read or looked into anything involving witchcraft or Wiccans, then you understand that there are a variety of paths. My point is, whatever spiritual path is involved, please don't make assumptions. So, a comparison of vampires and witches, this is my answer. Vampires are fictional characters that appear in books and movies. Witches are people who follow a spiritual path. Chapter 11 looks at Vlad Tepes or Vlad the Impaler as he is also known. The real life Romanian prince who Bram Stoker based his character Count Dracula on. Chapter 11 ends with the story of Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian countess. He mentions that her obsession of bathing in blood of young girls, she would continue to have a youthful appearance. This countess and her accomplices were responsible for the death of 600 victims. The punishment, because she was rich, her accomplices were not, was different for each of them. Her accomplices were tortured and executed. Elizabeth was sealed into a room and fed through a crack. Chapter 12 takes a look at goth, the subculture, and a worldview, as well as goth style. On page 148, he gives the definition. The term goth originally referred to an ancient European tribe famous for sacking Rome. Many centuries later, it was used to refer to a style of medieval architecture. Then it designated a genre of novel writing during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Only during the past two decades or so has the term been used to describe a fashion subculture. I wanted to point out that example because it shows how the meaning of a word changes over time. And in future videos, I'll be taking a look at ancient cultures and different linguistics. I think it's important that people understand that whether a book is written by an archaeologist, someone who just has a personal interest in that area, or a linguist, they're taking their best guess on what they believe the information is. So again, whether you're reading about vampires, reading about parapsychology, or reading about archaeology and other subjects, Always be sure to check your source 
And remember to keep in mind that when an author produces something, they have their opinion based on their impression of what they've found. In chapter 13, he actually has a bit of a disclaimer as it talks about real life cases of people who believe they're vampires and different activities that they're engaged in. Part four is a repetition of much of the earlier sections of the book. He takes a bit of a closer look at Dracula also of note, the author mentions, the details in the book are so consistent with real places, it's possible to take Dracula tours in both England and Romania. The author gives a very clear and concise summary of the novel Dracula, the characters, different things that were happening and the developments. My husband and I had this huge debate about whether Dracula could go out in the daylight. I said, no. My husband said, of course he could. We just watched one of the Dracula movies. You saw him out in the daytime. That debate actually inspired me to read Dracula again. I hadn't read it in a while. It turns out my husband was right. Dracula can go out in the daytime. He doesn't burn up. It's just his powers are not as strong as they are during the nighttime. The fact that I learned from reading this particular book is that whole out in the sun burn up concept of vampires actually started with the Hollywood movies. And I have to say, I was more than a little miffed that my husband was correct as I'm the one who enjoys reading the vampire novels. He's more of a mystery reader himself. So imagine my surprise when he turned out to be correct and I was wrong. Next, the author takes a look at The Vampire Chronicles. Interview with the Vampire was published in 1976. The series went on to include 13 different books. Let me know in the comments below if you've read the entire Vampire Chronicles series. The author concludes his book by going over the different vampire movies. Some of my favorite vampire movies. There's definitely the classic, which wasn't mentioned in The Idiot's Guide, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I remember watching this when I went to Fanshawe, which is Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. As well, as well as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. My favorite vampire movie is Dracula Untold. Although I've watched a lot of different vampire movies over the years, I enjoy this one, not just because of the acting and the script. It doesn't get into Vlad as the Impaler, but having read about Vlad and the various things that occurred throughout his life, this version actually looks at the man before the monster or the villain and why he made some of the choices that he did and what some of those motivations were. There are also a number of TV series about vampires. And it's funny, one of my favorite ones, which I've now watched a couple of times, is the originals. I don't know if one of the students who I used to debate with about vampires will ever see this, but we used to have this ongoing debate about Klaus, and I found him extremely offensive and extremely irritating, and I was definitely team Stefan because I'd also watched the Vampire Diaries. But I have to say, in terms of storyline, and family and choices people make, I really did enjoy watching the originals. Do you have a favorite vampire story or movie or program? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, if you enjoy reading vampire novels, you can find me on Goodreads, where I belong to a vampire book club. So it's a great place to get 
comments and ideas about the next good read where vampires are concerned. Until next time, happy reading!